We're going to wrap up our series, How to Read Your Bible, How to Read the Bible. And so it's this series that we've been in through the uh, month of January, really, and just trying to understand, you know, some key interpretive principles when it comes to approaching Scripture, really so that we start off on the right foot in engaging Scripture. And so we kind of have the tools necessary uh, when we're engaging Scripture to, you know, not just read the Bible, but allow it to permeate our hearts and soak into our minds. And so that's really what we're looking at. And so we've looked at a few different interpretive principles. The first one that we've looked at is that uh, Scripture functions in really leading us to a relationship, not a religion. That was the first interpretive principle that we really looked at, right? That the key of Scripture, right, that when Jesus the Word became flesh, right, that, that Jesus is the Word of God and took on flesh. And the reality is, is that with, with that, that, in, that, that really points us to the fact that God desires a relationship with us, not, not us to become very, like, religious and, and, and look at and approach the Bible as kind of a set of do's and don'ts and all these different things, right, that, that really God wants to have a relationship with us. It reveals to us God's character, God's rules, God's laws, right? Uh, but really, God wants a relationship with us. And so that's the first interpretive principle. We also talked about that relationship between the Old Testament and New Testament, because when we engage the Old Testament, right, we see that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament, and as he fulfilled the Old Testament, he empowers us to live it out as well in our lives. And so we looked at that as the key to understanding how the, the Old Testament and New Testament interact with one another, right? And that really the Old Testament is still relevant for you and I today. And then we also looked at last week how to, we looked at and explore really a few key doctrines. One was the doctrine of inspiration. And so we saw that, you know, that, that scripture is breathed out by God, right? And then we saw also that scripture is sufficient, right? That's called the sufficiency, the doctrine of sufficiency of scripture, meaning that there's nothing else needed for our, our Christian walk, right? That, that, Scripture leads us to, it, it points us to God, it points us to salvation, that there's no other revelation necessary, right? That's really what the doctrine of sufficiency has to say. And so today, in wrapping up our series, we're going to look at a, 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 crucian, a crucial and yet often, I think, overlooked aspect of Scripture. But first, I want to illustrate it for us this morning, maybe in a little bit different way. So I want you to imagine that you are going to be going on a six-plus-hour car ride, right? You're going to be driving six-plus hours away. You're you're, you're preparing for this trip, right? That's what you're... So just imagine with me kind of your mental preparation for that trip, right? You're not flying. You're going to have to drive, and so six-plus hours. Now I want you to add into the mix, kids, because that's always fun. I don't have trauma from that, from recent car trips or anything like that. Uh, but adding kids to the mix, right, that becomes a pretty tall order, right? Uh, six hours maybe on your own, yeah, that's, that's a little bit, that's, that's going to be, a, it's gonna be a, a tall order, but it's doable. Maybe a few other adults in the mix, it's, it's still doable, maybe a little bit more dicey, but when you add kids into that mix, right, really dicey. Now, imagine that six-hour car ride, but now nobody has to drive. Nobody has to drive. No, I'm not talking about hiring an Uber or anything like that, right, or hiring a chauffeur. What I'm talking about is this new and recent technology, right, and and it's kind of the new wave of technology for automobiles is self-driving cars, right? That's pretty remarkable. I mean, when I think about a six-hour car ride with my kids and, like, I don't have to, like, drive the whole time, hey, that's pretty sweet, (laughs) But think about that, right? You, you know, you, you think about like the, the, that technology, right? And if you've seen like videos of it, or maybe you've even seen a car that's kind of autonomous, it's driving on its own, right? Uh, if you've seen people in the car, right? They look like they're 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 doing it, right? Right? They look like they're they're driving the car, unless they're like you know doing something totally different. But the car is really driving itself. Now, why I share that illustration, right? Is that sometimes that's kind of our approach. To scripture, right? We we think that we're doing the heavy lifting, right? Well, I have to actually, I gotta, I gotta, you know, set aside that time. I gotta open my Bible. I gotta learn something out of this. I gotta study deeply, and I gotta do all these things. But really, what Scripture tells us is that God teaches us through His Word, right? That that really we might think of it 
like we're driving the car, but really God's driving the car when it comes to our engagement of Scripture. And we're going to understand that a little bit more as we dig into today's message. Because the Bible tells us that really God is doing the heavy lifting when it comes to our engagement of Scripture and how that works in the life of the believer. And so we need to understand this important and yet often overlooked principle of Scripture. And then we need to allow it to influence how we think about Scripture, allow it to influence our action towards Scripture, allow it to influence our feelings or even our attitudes about Scripture engagement. And so it's important for us as we kind of wrap up our message, our, our series today. And so I've titled the message, The Living Written Word. And we're going to go look at Hebrews 4 to understand, I think, this really important aspect of Scripture and why it's so important for your spiritual growth, for my spiritual growth. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 4. We don't have any screens, obviously, because we couldn't figure out a way that we could make that work, and it just makes things more complicated. So we're going to be a little bit old-fashioned. If you have your Bible, if you have you version on your Bible, a Bible app, hint, hint, I strongly recommend doing that. Most people have smartphones. Download that baby, and, and uh, it's always there in your pocket with you because we always have our phones. So, uh, But we're going to be looking at this important aspect of spiritual growth. And, and so, obviously, uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, there are two words that really stick out, that the Word of God is living and active. So I'm going to give you your fill-ins right away here, living and and active, right? <laughs> One and two, living and active. Uh, but we're going to dig into that just a little bit in each of those things of, about what that really means and why that's important for us, that the Word of God is living and active, right? So that, that, first, that first point, the Word of God is living. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 4. The Word of God is living and active. We'll pause there. We'll finish that off, that the Word of God is alive, that God's word is alive. And it's important for us as we think about God's word. Now, now, and kind of a counter illustration, right? In the movies, the Harry Potter movies, right? Or even in the books, some of the books are alive in Harry Potter, right? They kind of like move around and stuff like that. Uh, there's one book, it's called The Monster Book of Monsters. And it's pretty, it's pretty funny, but it kind of does some hijinks and you know, comedic things in the movies and in the books. But it resembles a spider, it has fangs, and when Harry tries to open it, it tries like lunging at him and like all that kind of stuff. And like when he drops it on the floor, it kind of scurries under the bed and it's like growling under the bed at him. It's, it's pretty funny. But anyways, the Word of God is alive, but not like that, right? We might get a little fanciful in the idea about the Word of God being alive. It's not like that. It's not the same way. But when we think about Scripture, when we think about who God is, right, the Old Testament, right, and throughout the Old Testament witness, the prophets, all of Scripture in the Old Testament, as well as even into the New Testament, what is the reference that's used towards God a lot? The living God, right? Because the people of Israel were differentiating their God as opposed to all the other numerous of gods around them, right? That, that were idols, that were false gods, that were made of wood and stone, right? They weren't alive, and yet... Their God, Yahweh, the living God, right? And there's that distinction that just as God is living, his word is living. And so the Holy Spirit who inspired the writers of the Bible continues to inspire the readers of the Bible, engaging scripture with this understanding that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit really permeates this book and that when we read this book, it's unlike any other book that we can engage here on earth, right? That when we read these pages, it's imbued, empowered, filled with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that's why I think, one, it's important practically to bookend our engagement with Scripture and prayer. We begin our engagement of Scripture. If we really want to understand Scripture, begin it with prayer, asking the Holy Spirit to teach you from the Word, it's imbued with the Holy Spirit's presence and power, and God teaches us through his word. Think about what Luke tells us. According to Luke, when, if you remember that, that passage in Luke 24, where the disciples, they're on the road to Emmaus, right? And they're on the road to Emmaus, and, and they're kind of talking with Jesus, although they don't know it's him, right? Jesus kind of appears to these two disciples. They're not named. They're walking on the road to Emmaus. And they're talking with Jesus, and, and it's kind of like they're just pouring out their, their frustration, 
They're pouring out their dis- disappointment, their discouragement. They're pouring out their even unbelief, it seems. And they're talking about the Passover, what just recently happened at the Passover, right? And, and, and that J- this Jesus, who they had hoped to be the Messiah, was dead, right? And, and, and some of the other disciples claim that he had risen from the, from the grave and that they'd even saw angels, right? They're telling this to Jesus as they're walking down the road. And they're kind of, I mean, when you read it, they're not including themselves in the ones. Like, they're not saying, like, hey, we believe what these disciples are saying, right? They're not necessarily including themselves in this. They're saying, like, yeah, some of them, they, saw, they, they claim to saw Jesus. They claim to saw angels. Like, they're not really including themselves. If you really read the passage, they're not including themselves as ones who really believe what was being reported to them, right? But they're on this road. They're walking. And Jesus says to them in Luke 24, 25 through 27, he responds to them. He says, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, that Jesus opened their minds to understand the scripture and what scripture taught about him, right? And, and so the same thing happens, right? When we pray and when we ask the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth that Jesus said in, in John 16 would guide us into all truth, right? That when we pray to the Holy Spirit during our Bible engagement, when we say, Holy Spirit, teach me, I, I, I want to learn from your word, I want to understand. When we ask the Holy Spirit to help us in that regard, I believe God honors that request. God honors that. And so I want to encourage us first, when we think about the word of God being living, if it's living, then bathe your scripture reading and prayer, asking the Holy Spirit to teach you because God's word is living. And then secondly, the word of God is active, right? So when we read that, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, Think about that imagery of a a double-edged sword coming out of the mouth of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, but sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. That not only is Scripture alive, not only is Scripture living, but it is active. It's active. And these metaphors that are being used here are really describing the activity, right, of the Spirit and the activity of the Word. So, as one commentary I read, it put it like this, that the Word of God is the only power that can penetrate so deeply and expose so completely the inwardness of our being, that the Word of God is powerfully active. It's living and it's active. And really, concerning the activity of God's word, right? This isn't a new concept. The Old Testament is filled with that as well. I mean, think about Isaiah 55, like God speaking through the prophet Isaiah, talking about the activity of his word. And he says, so my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. That God's word is living and it's active. It's going to accomplish its intended Purposes. And so when we interact with Scripture, Scripture speaks afresh and it speaks anew to us. And that's why we can read passages in this book, right? That's why when you approach this book and you read this passage, no, many, no matter how many times you read it, you can get something new out of those pages. And I know I'm talking to, to preaching to the choir. Many of you, you've been Christians for a long time. You've probably read through this book countless times. And each time, you've probably gained some new insight or understanding from the Holy Spirit about a certain passage, about something that you've read. And so it's practical for us to keep in mind that we should never grow weary, right, of reading Scripture, even those texts that maybe are our favorite or we're extremely familiar with. Maybe we've committed them to memory, right? We're like, "Ah, I know that. I don't need to read that. You know, it may seem redundant. But because of the activity and the presence of the Holy Spirit, Right, The Bible has the power to speak a fresh word to us in every season and in every situation and stage of our lives. And so God's word, it's always active. It's always fresh. But there's another implication of the activity of God's word that I think it's important for us to understand. 
And really what the writer of Hebrews is outlining here when he's using these metaphors, right? And even in verse 13, when he's saying, no creature is hidden from his sight, right? That, that, that there's, there's another activity of God's word that it's important for us to understand. That other activity is that it exposes things, right? It exposes things that are in our heart. The heart is that metaphorical, like, seed of personal, like, our center of our personal self-being, right? Jesus affirmed that idea of the heart being kind of the center, the metaphor of the center of our, our personal being, right? When Jesus talks about things like in Matthew 6, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, or when he teaches in, in Matthew 15 about what defiles a person, right? Because there's this argument like, you know, eating unclean food or not doing the ceremonial cleanings, right? If you eat with unclean hands, you're defiling yourself. And Jesus says, what comes out of the mouth precedes the heart. That's what defiles a person. And then he goes on to list all of these things that can come out of the heart, like evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, Jesus says. And so the heart, right, the word of God exposes what's in my heart. It points out my bad attitudes, points out my idols, points out the sinfulness that's in my heart. And if we allow it to, it will begin to cut and remove those things. See, friends, God's word can even expose those idols and false gods that we have unintentionally enthroned over Jesus in our heart even now. And that takes conviction, right? The Holy Spirit convicts us, and we don't like to feel conviction. Conviction is uncomfortable. We don't like it. And unfortunately, because people don't like conviction... We tend to, you know, dull the activity of the Holy Spirit through God's word. How do we do that? Well, by explaining away the things that convict us, right? If I don't really like what God's word's saying to me, well then, uh, you know, that was just an archaic thing. Or that was a cultural thing. Yeah, that's not for today. You see, there's a danger in those types of things. When we start to explain away Scripture, when we start to explain away the things that are convicting us, we are dulling the effect of the Holy Spirit on our hearts, pointing out the things that maybe, yeah, those aren't right. We need to get rid of those things, right? And many people do that, right? They dull the activity of the Holy Spirit by explaining away the Scripture that doesn't affirm either their sinful desires or even their preconceived ideas about how God should operate, right? And unfortunately, then, they seek out churches and pastors and teachers who don't talk about sin and repentance, who don't talk about holiness and obedience, who don't talk about the whole counsel of Scripture because it's easy to escape conviction. But the Word of God is living and active, God wants to remove those things. That's what happens through Scripture. When I engage Scripture on a regular basis, God points out the things in my life that aren't matching up to His Word. And if I allow the Holy Spirit to do that work, the hard work, but if I allow the Holy Spirit to do that work, God will remove those parts that maybe aren't aligning with and change my heart. And so that's the big idea I want us to walk away with today. Allow the Holy Spirit to open the scriptures to you, to teach you, and to change you. Allow the Holy Spirit, because it's a personal choice. We have to allow the, the, the Holy Spirit. God doesn't force us into this, right? We have to be okay with the conviction, okay with the areas that maybe we're not matching up and say, okay, God, I, I can't do this on my own. I need you to do some heart surgery on me. And God will be faithful to do that. So allow God to do that. Allow the Holy Spirit to open the scriptures to you and to change your heart from the inside out, right? So I want to close us today in just one of those areas that scripture points out, right? Because in scripture it tells us that 
We're all naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account, that we must give an account. Scripture tells us that it's appointed unto man to die one death, right? To die once, and then after that to face judgment. And when we stand before the judgment seat of God, right, we have to give an account. The only answer that will be a satisfactory answer in giving an account to the Lord is that whether you've called on Jesus for salvation and committed your life to following him. And so I want to give us an opportunity to understand that because Scripture reveals some things to us. Scripture A reveals that we have to admit sin because the reality is that we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God, that none of us are perfect. We are all sinners. The wages of sin is death. That's a spiritual death. That's a physical death. But the free gift of God, right, is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so Scripture tells us that, A, we have to admit sin, and B, believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sin, that it's not by being a good enough person, trying to do all these good works to bring ourselves back to God, but it's really by grace through faith that we are saved, that we are restored, brought back into right relationship with God the Father. It's by Christ's shed blood on the cross, not by our good works. So B, we have to believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and then C, call on Jesus for salvation and commit to follow him because scripture says not only did Jesus die on the cross for our sin, but three days later he rose from the grave. And that when we call on Jesus, we are, we are, we are really, his righteousness is imparted to us. It's credited to our account. And that no longer does God see a, a sinful person, but he sees the righteousness of Christ. Because the sin has been covered, it's been atoned for, it's been removed. And we can be brought back in that right standing. And so, really what Scripture tells us is that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. That's what Scripture reveals to us about this important topic. And all it takes is a confession. All it takes is a prayer saying, Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. Help me to live for you. And I want to encourage you, if you've never made that decision, if you've never trusted in the grace through faith found in Jesus, I want to encourage you, don't leave here today without doing that. It's as simple prayer as that. But don't leave here today without doing that, without settling, at least allowing Scripture to permeate your heart in that way and leading you to the most important decision you can make. 